lobby to get this through because there were, there were those that didn't want another flag. You know, it took years and years to get the uh, um, lack of uh, yeah. It took, took years to get that, and uh, so it, it took about three years to get uh, the honor remember flag. Um, what did not pass? What did not pass and it was in the tax bill? If the governor would have signed the tax bill, in fact, 89 or almost 90 percent of the legislators, the 200, 201 legislators that we have, we have 134 in the House, 67 in the Senate, 89 percent of those signed the tax bill. Okay? There was a one word problem. I think it was is and it should have been and or something like that. And uh, it had to do with some funding for the Viking Stadium or whatever. Well, it could have been corrected. And the governor still could have signed it. And what two provisions was in there for the um, for military, for the military service credit. Military service credit would be increased from seven hundred and fifty to a thousand dollars. Seven fifty is current law. And the phase out of the credit would begin at fifty thousand instead of the current thirty thousand. That's in there. And if we do have a special session, I know we'll we'll pass the uh, uh, the tax bill. <coughs> This is a, you know, that's something everybody wanted on both sides of the aisle. Another one, we would have extended the property tax exclusion for spouses of disabled veterans following the, the veteran's death. Uh, the current exclusion is available for spouses of a veteran with 70% or more disability rating for eight years following the veteran's death. That's really a big thing for a spouse after the veteran's death to uh, not be hit with a big tax, uh, property tax bill, so that uh, they can stay in their house. When, we, when I first came into office, it was only two more years. We raised it five years, eight years, and now if this passes, the exclusion would be available to the spouse with no limit on the amount of years until the home changes uh, ownership or until the spouse uh, remarries. And this is a big thing for, for some surviving spouses, because many of them you know, if you're 70 to 100% disabled, many of them really had to do a lot to care for their, their spouse. I know. So, I know I've probably bored you more with the legislation stuff than maybe what, what I talked about in the military. I agree with you. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I really feel that uh, we need to speak with one voice. And let me just close with this. This was given to me by uh, a Korean War veteran while I was speaking at the Minneapolis Veterans Home. And it's, uh, the author of it was uh, Charles M. Province, a U.S. Army veteran. And it's just called, it's just called The Veteran. It is a veteran, not the preacher, who has given us the freedom of religion. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who has given us the freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, that has given us the freedom of free speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the politician, I'll repeat that, it is the veteran, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. Remember, it is the veteran who salutes the flag, who serves the flag, and is laid to rest under the flag. God bless our veterans. Thank you. Thank you.
the contest for all the work she's done, the different associations, the Nurse Association, the uh, NAGAS, the different committees, the, the Women's Leadership Forum, the stuff she's done for me and for the cohort, for the War Office, she's done a lot of stuff. She's a true part professional, and I want her to be a great part of the Next up, seven behind represents Bob Deppner is uh, County Fire Service Officer from Grant County for 12 years. Uh, Joseph Jumpstead is also the first RB Combat Team Command Sergeant Major. Uh, veteran, uh, just returned from the National Training Center, a long summer, so just appreciate taking the time out of a busy summer to just get a handle of us, talk about some veterans' issues and services available to you as veterans. So without further ado, yes, thank you. Good morning. So, uh, I'm honored to be invited to come and visit with you. I am uh, Joe Jelmstead, Grand County Veteran Service Officer. Um, and uh, today we're going to go just a little overview of veteran service, uh, the things that veteran service officers do, and what we assist veterans with, the main areas that we cover. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the details as you wish, but uh, we're going to hit about, what, 15 minutes? Yeah. So, uh, so it won't be real long, but I'll be around to answer questions that you need afterwards. So, the slide. So, Joe Jones said, Grant County Veterans Service Officer. For those of you that don't know, Grant County is uh, Elbow Lake is the county seat. That still doesn't tell you where we're at. We're west of Alexandria area. Grant County is a small uh, farming county, uh, about six thousand residents there. Uh, Elbow Lake is uh, about twelve hundred population, so the, the population center, if you will. We've got about 500 veterans there. So the thing that I'm very fortunate about in, in that situation is that I can give that tailored care to those individuals. I have a lot of veterans that will call me on a daily basis just to share what's going on in their day, um, or if they need to, to chat about something, and it really gives me that opportunity to get to know my veterans and work very closely with them, so I appreciate that. First Brigade CSM, um, I live in Battle Lake, which is in Ottertail County, so I commute down to uh, Grant. Uh, it's a tough commute, it's about 35 miles. Uh, the traffic is a killer, uh, the deer, the turkeys, and uh, everything else that are around there are pretty tough. And then of course Lake Christina distracts my view, so I uh, love being up in that area and, and I thoroughly enjoy it. So. Um, next slide. So we're gonna talk about an overview of veteran service officer work. Um, these are kind of book type answers. We work within the Veterans Affairs Systems to advocate for veterans and families. You can read that, assist veterans and their families. Um, as I said, in tailoring and, and being in a small county, I have the privilege of being able to do pretty much anything that veterans need. If they come into my office and say, you know, Joe, I am struggling with my medical bill for such and such. I don't have to sift out whether it's a VA issue or anything else. I have the opportunity to assist them with that. It's good and bad. Sometimes that, that gets them more dependent on coming into my office. Uh, I, I sometimes look at some of them and say, you haven't even opened this to try to read it, but let's do it now. Um, so in different counties, um, you're going to have different things that they'll be able to take care of for you. If you go into Hennepin County, they don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Um, which leads me to veteran service and veteran service officers. In the state of Minnesota, we are very fortunate and the legislators saw the importance of county veteran service officers. By state statute, every county is required to have a veteran service officer. That doesn't mean they have to have one exclusive to their county. There are some that share. So Pope County and Stevens County share a veteran service officer. He's full time, but he bounces back and forth between those two offices. Um, and it's not a requirement in every state either. So each state is different as well. Um, in order to be a veteran service officer, you must be a veteran. Uh, the definition of a veteran being by VA definition, 181 days of active duty service other than training with an honorable discharge. Um, so oftentimes I end up in the discussion with uh, individuals who are looking for benefits to say, well, I did my six years in the National Guard back in 1972 to 1978 and I'm looking for benefits. And at that point, I unfortunately, oftentimes, have to explain to them that they don't qualify as a veteran by VA definition. If that's a surprise to anyone, I guess, you know, it, it's, it's a tough deal and it's very difficult to explain. 
Um, but six years of guard service without an activation, uh, even if you have 181 days for training purposes, does not qualify you as a veteran. So you must be a veteran to be a veteran service officer. Next slide. So the agenda, we're going to kind of broad brush over the different areas that we cover. Please ask questions if you have them along the way. Uh, we're going to try to stay away from the I know someone who, because we could be in that all doggone day long. I'll take those questions afterwards. Um, but we're going to give an overview on the different areas, and these are the main areas that we cover. Healthcare, compensation, pension, education, optical, dental, and emergency assistance. And kind of those broad areas that we hit. Next slide. So healthcare. Healthcare is a big issue in our, in our world right now, in our society. Uh, the requirement to have healthcare uh, under the Affordable Care Act uh, gets additional folks coming in looking for, for VA healthcare. And you'd be surprised how many individuals uh, have never been to see their veteran service officer. They may be a veteran of Korea. Uh, I had a gentleman in uh, a couple weeks ago who uh, has been out for nearly 50 years and has never talked to a veteran service officer who was interested in coming in for health care. So in order to be eligible for health care, uh, veterans separate under other than dishonorable conditions. Health care is one of those that as long as you it, did not have a dishonorable discharge, they can do what's called an administrative upgrade. So they will take a look at what happened, what, why you got the discharge you did, and they can potentially uh, administratively raise that so that you're eligible. Um, again, National Guard Reserve Service with uh, active duty for training only do not qualify. The enhanced eligibility areas, those are those, if you did this, you automatically qualify for that. So POW, Purple Heart, um, Medal of Honor, 10% service connected or more, as you can see up there. Vietnam service. Vietnam service is kind of a sticky one. Who knows brown water versus blue water ships? Anyone know what I'm talking about there? Right, okay. <coughs> River boats versus ocean boats. Essentially, yes. So brown water versus blue water ships. If you Google search brown water ships, a list will come up. Those are Navy vessels or ships that were operating in that area that have been deemed to be exposed to Agent Orange. So if you were on a large ship uh, off the coast of Vietnam and didn't get into an area that they determined to be brown water, whether it was the harbor, uh, Da Nang Harbor, or any of that area, your ship may not be on that list. If your ship isn't on that list and you didn't set foot on ground in Vietnam, you do not count as presumptive for Agent Orange exposure. So that's a big deal. That list changes on a very, very regular basis because they push to get those, those ships added. So you think, well, hey, uh, Joe, if you weren't in there, then you shouldn't get it. Well, the issue becomes the Agent Orange didn't dissipate just because it was at this line in the ocean, right? Those vessels suck that water out of the ocean process that water and you're drinking it and you're showering it. They probably had more or, or certainly even exposure as anyone that set foot on the ground. Um, but it's a battle for them to get that, that service connection. So Vietnam service, Gulf War, um, Camp Lejeune. Anyone familiar with the Camp Lejeune issue? Chief, you got to give them a little brief on Camp Lejeune. It was a, as I understand it, a dry cleaner that leached chemicals into the drinking water on post, and lots were, um, were infected, affected by that bad water for some years. Absolutely. So PCBs and some of those sorts of things. There was a dry cleaner, a couple of them in town, that were dumping their chemicals, and it was finding its way into the, uh, the surface water and the drinking water that was making its way to post. So if you served on Camp Lejeune for 30 days between 1957 and I think it was 1984, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, you are eligible for medical benefits there. The other thing is, a lot of people have heard about the dry cleaners. The one they haven't heard about is the uh, diesel tanks that were buried on post. So near Terrawa Terrace, they have approximately a million gallons over that time frame that are unaccounted for, diesel. So it was leaching into the soil, leaching into the system, uh, and, and folks were drinking. So for veterans, you know, 
we, we look at it and go, well, that's part of my service. Uh, you know, it sucks, but it's gone on forever. We had Agent Orange exposure. We had all these exposures. The thing that we forget about is all those families. So folks that were permanent party on that, on that post and had their families there and had uh, birth defects with their children, miscarriages, and all those sorts of things, you know, the exposure and the experience is one horrible thing. The other side of it is they delay a lot of that stuff trying to figure out what they're going to do because we can't have a family member come to the VA for treatment. It is veterans only. So family <coughs> members are starting to look at some of those things as presumptive and helping them through other, other processes. But it, that's, that's also in the process. And catastrophically disabled uh, finally is one that um, catastrophic disability is essentially the inability to care for yourself. Uh, and your daily needs through some sort of uh, accident or issue that you have. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a veteran that went, a uh, young man, went to Mexico with his family and uh, was down there doing some body surfing, uh, in pretty good shape, uh, sober, not drinking at the time, was going to grab one more wave. And as he was coming in on that wave, on his board or boogie, body surfing probably isn't right, his boogie board or whatever, dumped off the front of the wave and planted his head right in the, in, the, in the bottom of the ocean. Compression fracture, uh, burst fracture on one of his uh, um, vertebrae. Uh, lucky to be alive, if it had been one higher, he would have uh, ceased to breathe. Um, so instead, he's a uh, paraplegic with some use of his arms and whatnot. Catastrophic disability. So he automatically gains access and, and the ability to utilize it. So the other eligibility, health care, if you don't have a service connection, is a means-based program, means being your income. So if you are a farmer who was in the service and you're on your farm and you're making a bazillion dollars, you really don't need that service. You are presumed to be able to, to take care of yourself and your needs. So household income for Grant County, if you're a veteran alone and you make more than $39,325, you are not eligible for to get into VA health care unless you have a service connection. All right, does that make sense? The one thing on that is that if you have non-reimbursed medical expenses or some other expenses, they can bring that down. Um, they, they come off the top there, so there is some, some, other, some wiggle room there, but typically that's the income. Alright, we're going to kind of skip through healthcare priority groups, but essentially once you're in, you're assigned to a priority group. In the end, I'll talk a little bit about the down and dirty on priority groups, but if you are priority group one, that means your service connected disability is a 50% more or more um, disability or determined unemployable. So you can kind of see those. Next slide. Take a look and see. You can see where some fall in. Ionizing radiation. Um, you know, when we look at it as veterans and as service members, we go through some crazy shit that the Army and, and the, the services do to us. I had a veteran who was in uh, from the Bikini Islands uh, nuclear testing, and I was chatting with him, and he wanted you know some things taken care of. And, and so I have the opportunity to visit with these folks, and sometimes they chat and sometimes they don't. And, and he, was, he was a chatty guy. And I said, what the heck was that like? He said, well, they took us all up on deck at the appointed time. They had to stand at the rail and face a direction. They said, close your eyes and put your hands over your face and wait. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he could see the bones in his fingers, is what he said. So he could see the bones in his fingers because the blast was so bright that it just illuminated everything. So then they go back to their their service. They just kind of do their thing then and wait. So he's down below decks the next morning. The whole ship is in a panic. They have got every sailor, all hands on deck, scrubbing the decks to get the radiation fallout off of this ship. They were closer than they thought they were, than, than, they, than they had planned. I said, well, what the heck? How did you, he said, all my buddies are gone. I said, how did you make it? He said, I was a cook. The only people that didn't have scrubbing the decks were those of us that were making the chow. 
So I wasn't up on the deck scrubbing. I wasn't as exposed as they were. I was downstairs cooking. And uh, the guy's character, he, he shared his story quite, uh, quite readily. But, uh, so anyhow, and the last bullet on priority group six is uh, combat operations <coughs> after November 11th. So if you are a uh, recent returnee post uh, 1998, you get five years. You get three. <coughs> now it's five years of VA health care. Um, with no questions asked and no debates. Next slide. Priority group seven. These are those that make below the number that I gave you, but above the minimum number for no <coughs> copay. So they may have, there's two different levels of copay. So that's priority group seven, priority group eight. The big bold part that I put on there is burn pit registry. So I'm not going to ask the question. Because I don't, well, okay, how many have done the burn pit registry? How many are eligible or have exposure to burn pit? So pretty close. So as of Tuesday, they have 85,155 participants in the burn pit registry. And every time I have an opportunity to speak to a group such as yourselves, I hammer the burn pit registry. And you're like, why? And here's the reason why. Number one, your soldiers don't want to do it. They don't have time. It's not important. It doesn't really matter to me right now. I'm not having any problems, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mirror the burn pit registry, in my opinion. This is Joe Johnston's opinion, not the VA's necessarily. It's going to be our Agent Orange. What they did with Agent Orange is when they started to have some issues and figure out that there might be something linked to this, they started collecting names. I started looking at it and saying, hmm, maybe we've got an issue here. So then as they started collecting names and they started to cross-reference and look and see what was going on and individuals were having issues with prostate cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and all the different things, uh, ischemic heart disease. And so they slowly started to take some action and eventually uh, awarded the, uh, those, those cases and started to do that. Well, they're doing the same thing with the burn pit registry. So when you go into the burn pit registry, for those of you that haven't uh, and are eligible, you will go through and you will, you will put in and verify your dates of service, your locations of service, and your exposures. So if you think that, hey, I wasn't out there tending a burn pit, it's not just about the burn pit. It's about the dust and dirt exposure as well because there are heavy metals and all that that are, that are in those soils from the wars that have been going on over there, in nanoparticles that get down into your lungs. And when they get into your lungs and into the bottom of your lungs, your lungs don't have the ability to push them out. So it causes issue with the air exchange or the oxygen exchange in the, in the smallest levels down there. And so that's where soldiers are having that issue. And as you well know, they would never procrastinate and say it isn't our fault, right? <laughs> Gulf War Syndrome, okay? So what I ask for you uh, in the burn pit registry area is ask your soldiers, ask the soldiers that you work with and the people that you're around and push them to get in there because what it does is it documents and shows the VA who's <laughs> dealing with what and what issues they're having so that down the road they can say, okay, we've got the data to show that if you were deployed in this area of Iraq, in this time frame, you have a 5% more likely chance that you're going to have an issue with this. Without that data, they'll continue to tell us we don't know what we're talking about. And so it, it's very important. So I ask that you, you push that. Any questions on bird pit? Is there a deadline for it? There isn't a deadline for it. Uh, it I, would, I would presume this will be open for as long as they are still gathering data. The, the deadline issue to me is the fact that the sooner they get that information and have uh, the input, the sooner they can make some decisions. Because the VA will kick the can down the road. Because guess what? You're going to die from this shit eventually if you get it, right? If you've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from your exposure to Agent Orange and they procrastinate for 10 years in, in making that presumptive, they pay less, right? I'm not saying that the government's out to get you. I'm not trying to make you paranoid. But what I'm saying is we need to push to get them to acknowledge the issues that are out there, the realistic issues. Any other questions on burn pit? And the last thing that they'll have on there is they will ask you if you want an exam. 
So we'll say right on there, do you have concerns about your health as a result of your exposure? Would you like an exam? And all you have to do is click it and they'll contact you and, they, and you can go in and, and get checked out. Next slide. So the healthcare down and dirty bottom line. If you're a priority group one, they're going to cover anything you've got throughout your entire body. They're basically saying, hey, you're at 50%. You're going to be able to connect whatever you've got with something else that you've got connected. So we'll take care of you. Uh, your health care with no propane. Priority group two, three, four, and five, your service connected, uh, no co your service connected issues are not going to be a copay. Your non-service connected issues may have a copay. So if I've got a service connection, which we're going to talk about comp and pen, if I've got a service connection for my knee and I qualify to use the VA system, they will take care of my knee, any issue I have with my knee. But if I go in for a pain I'm having in my abdomen, I might have a copay like you would have with insurance of $15 for the office visit and $8 or $9 for prescription. Priority group six, uh, no copay or no copay for qualifying period, depending on, you know, that was the one with the five year hitch in there. Um, and then seven and eight is based on your income. So eight or nine dollar copay, depending on what, uh, what your income is. That is healthcare in a very small nutshell. Any questions on that? <coughs> this is gonna be a long one, isn't it? All right, so compensation, the one that everyone wants to know about. There's a, uh, an explanation of compensation. Essentially, compensation is the payment that you get as a veteran for a service-connected issue. And we're going to talk about service connection and the different types of service connection. But essentially what the VA is saying is, all right, if you're at 30% service-connected, they're going to pay you, they're going to look at the chart and say, okay, 30%, we're going to give you this much a month. And what they're paying you for is that by their rating, you are 30% less able to maintain gainful employment than you were when you came into it. That's the translation. And so they're compensating you for that issue or those issues at the rate that you are rated. Does that make more sense? 0% service connection is not zero. And I have to explain that a lot to veterans. If you go in and you say, I've got a knee issue. My knee cracks, pops, and does all sorts of things that it never did before I came into the service. They may look at you and say, okay, well, let's check that out. Okay, what happened? You know, we're gonna talk about the process of, of connection, but if they say, yep, that's service connected, but we're gonna connect it at 0%. I'll give them that to so come into my office. They're like, this is bullshit. They gave me nothing. No, they didn't give you nothing. They claimed it. They own it. As that knee condition gets worse, as you get older, you generate arthritis in there, and you start to have issues with not being able to extend and not being able to walk as well, they'll do a reevaluation. You go in and you say, hey, VA, I would like a reevaluation of my service connected or service condition. And they'll look at how far you can flex it and do all their readings, and they may increase it. What 0% means is it's not compensable. It hasn't reached a point where it's causing you issues with employment. So therefore, they're not going to compensate you for your inability to maintain gainful employment as a doctor. Okay. Um, goes in 10% increments, 0 to 100% zero to in 10% uh, increments, um, and you receive a monthly check for that. When you hit 30% is when they start giving you a little more for housing and whatnot. So it's kind of like a VAH type of situation. And that's all as a very prescribed, uh, prescribed chart. Next one. So there's five ways to service connection. First one is pretty easy, direct service connection. I was running and my foot went in a hole and I twisted my knee and I was treated at the TMC and here's my paperwork. That is a direct service connection, directly connected to your service. Pre-existing condition, I have a knee condition from when I was in football in high school You've taken me into the service and said I'm good to go. I had something happen while I was in the service, not normal wear and tear on that same knee condition, but something that caused aggravation higher than normal level. That would be an aggravated condition. Service connected by the